Fabrice Calmes. I'm working for the Yukon Research Center of the Yukon College at Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada. And I'm studying permafrost and uh, northern geomorphology. So I am a permafrost scientist. So I'm studying uh, frozen ground. Um, I'm very involved in the impact of uh, climate change on permafrost and uh, how this uh, induces um, landscape change that may affect uh, society. For example, well, uh, when permafrost is degrading, uh, there is a lot of uh, settling that, uh, that occur, collapsing, and if it occurs below buildings or infrastructures, so you can have a lot of damage. But also, if your landscape is changing, the activity of the people living uh, on, the, on, uh, on the territory uh, may be affected by that. So I'm studying the, uh, all the impacts from permafrost degradation. Permafrost is uh, really a, a climate, climatic, climate uh, phenomenon. It's, uh, it's there because uh, you have cold air temperature uh, all year long. So um, when you have this cold air, the ground starts to freeze and uh, it exists for, uh, for millennium. Um, so obviously when the atmosphere is warming, uh, permafrost will be uh, impacted because it's not now in equilib thermal equilibrium with the atmosphere. So permafrost start to uh, start to thaw. Depending the kind of permafrost that you have, uh, you can uh, have uh, no sign of degradation because permafrost contains no ice, for example. So when it thaws, there is no uh, loss of volume in the ground. Uh, but we can see the temperature of the permafrost warming. In, uh, when you have uh, what we call thaw-sensitive permafrost, which means that it is a permafrost with warm temperature and also uh, an important amount of uh, excess ice in the ground, then you can observe the, um, a lot of phenomenon like um, landslides, uh, collapsings, uh, the formation of, uh, of lakes and ponds. Presently, I'm working along the Alaska Highway, and uh, when permafrost is towing, you can see uh, cracks appearing in the shoulder of the, of the road. You can also have um, bumps forming, uh, a lot of collapsing. Okay, so the cracks in the highway. So uh, we made a calendar with different pictures of our research at the Yukon Research Center. And this is a picture I, I took. So if you want to see the kind of cracks that we can have, that this kind of crack. And why it forms is because you have a lot of uh, ice in the ground and this is uh, a picture of a permafrost core, so you can see because it is a cylinder, so we use a, a corer, and you can see that all this, uh, all this part is pure ice. So of course, when permafrost tow and it starts from the top of the of the permafrost, all the ice is uh, melting, and all uh, uh, the all the ground is knowing um, a subsidence. So the road uh, the road has to be uh, maintained uh, on almost a yearly basis. They have to resurface the road constantly. For the Alaska Highway, it takes eight times more money to maintain than any other road in Canada. So yes, it takes a lot of money. Um, we made also a survey in communities, in village, and we saw a building affected by permafrost tow. And, um, the building start to be start to tilt. Some cracks appear in uh, in the walls. Um, um, Sometimes windows break because you know the the building sh change of shape. Uh, the doors cannot close anymore. Um, in one of the school uh, in a community in Whitehorse, uh, one of the uh, one of the big glass in the window in the library uh, just fall on the ground, there was nothing at the time. There is, sorry, there was nobody at the time, but it was like uh, relatively scary for the kids. Okay, so permafrost is any kind of ground uh, that is frozen at least for two consecutive years. 
It means that it can be bedrock in mountain, it can be gravel, and it can be uh, any kind of sediment pit. Um, the one that is the most problematic is a uh, fine sediment, silt, clay, because in this kind of sediment, when permafrost develop, a ground ice named segregated ice forms. You have lands of ice forming each time that the permafrost progresses in the ground. So um, it's only it mainly occur in sediment soil, um, and it's quite widespread at least in many areas of the world. This kind of uh, fine uh, texture uh, sediment and permafrost is really um, common in a lot of area in northern Quebec. It's uh, um, in northern Quebec. It is uh, marine marine clay. Uh, in uh, Northwest Territories, it can be marine clay, but also uh, Lake Ustream clay from uh, ancient uh, glacial lake. Um, you can have this in also in all the uh, river, rivers uh, channel. So uh, yes, it's relatively widespread. No, uh, it's hard to put number in it, you know. Uh, so I was talking about the school in the community of Frost River. They already, they made the, they made the first school end of the, at the end of the 70s. And they rebuilt it completely uh, in the early 2000s. So you can consider that each 20 years, sometime you have to uh, rebuild your building. So life expectancy of, uh, of building in permafrost um, is for sure is, sh is shorter than uh, any other building. Um, now it depends also about how well the building was built. When you're trying to build uh, on permafrost, uh, you want to make it in equilibrium with permafrost. You don't want to disturb the ground surface. So you will try to uh, build uh, on a gravel pad and uh, or to use um, piles. And, and you will try to have air passing below the building to keep uh, the permafrost cold and help the heat to extract from the ground. You can put a price on, uh, on a building on, on a road. But it's, uh, sometimes it's hard more to put a price on uh, the health of people, um, the way that, the, you know, the change of way of life in some, ca in some case. Um, it's hard to quantify, you know. Mm. Uh, some people are living in a land, a uh, lot of First Nations um, rely on, on their land to, have, uh, to find food and supply. Um, they hunt for us specific animals, they live in specific environment, and these environments are changing, so the animals, the fauna is changing too, and they cannot hunt this animal anymore because the environment is not suitable for them, uh, so they will have to uh, rely more on the, the, the food coming from the south. Um, how could you, can you put a price on that, you know? When permafrost uh, degrades, it uh, induces a lot of change in the landscape. You may have some uh, forest in some area with uh, permafrost underneath, and when the, the permafrost is towing, uh, we say that the, the forest gets drunk, you know, because uh, the, the trees are, are tilting, and um, all this forest is uh, replaced by wetland, marsh, ponds, lake. So, um, if you needed the wood, the wood is not there anymore. Um, if you have a trap line, you know, to uh, trap animals for fur or for food, uh, you have difficulties to access your, uh, your, your site because uh, trees are collapsing or because there is a pond at, an, uh, on your trail. Um, some animals are very uh, attached linked to some specific environment, uh, like caribou. Caribou uh, eat uh, lichens, but, uh, and you can find a lot of lichens on permafrost, permafrost mounds and permafrost plateau in some area. Uh, when these permafrost mounds and permafrost plateau disappear, 
the caribou won't, won't come here anymore. Um, there is people gathering berries, uh, medicinal plants on this area. So when the area disappear, well, they lose this, uh, this land for these uh, activities. Um, yeah, so for sure, you know, I think that ground is part of three very important elements for life. You have air, you have water, you have the ground. You're living on it, right? Except if you are a bird and you can fly uh, all the time. Um, so, and permafrost is frozen ground. So when it, fro when, when it freezes, the ground change, and when it thaws, the ground change back to something else. So it's just like we are changing your environment, and it's very, it, we, you know, when we say, oh, ground is solid, you know, ground is like uh, something certain. With, permaf uh, with permafrost, it's not the case, you know, because you can walk on, the, on a place one year, and the year after, you cannot walk there. There is a lot of discussion about how permafrost, when it will tow, or when it, when it is tow, will uh, have an, in, an impact on uh, greenhouse gases. Okay? So about uh, how permafrost may produce uh, green out, green, uh, greenhouse gas, um, because a soil that is frozen is relatively, biologically, is not very active. We don't have a lot of bacterial activities, and, and but a lot of permafrost occur in organic soils. And when it starts to thaw, there is a layer that we call the active layer, which is the top part of the ground, and that thaw and freeze each year. If uh, your permafrost uh, is warming, this uh, this layer will become more and more thicker each year, and all the elements contained in this, uh, in this layer uh, will be reactivated. So there will be more bacterial processes, biological processes. Uh, in some cases, this, this permafrost uh, contains gases. Um, so when the active layer is deepening, uh, you will have more biological activity, more greenhouse gas release, like uh, di uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and we try to put number on uh, this uh, on this gas emission because it's like a cycle. You know, climate is warming, uh, permafrost is thawing, uh, gas are released, so the warming is even more important, and there is a, a loop, a feedback, and so yes, this um, carbon dioxide and methane release from permafrost is one of uh, of the current. Uh, hot activity research. Mm. Originally, I come from uh, Corsica, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. So very warm, very beautiful, mountain everywhere. Um, and I made, um, I made a part of my study in oceanography. At some point in my study in France, I went in a laboratory that was specialized in uh, periglacial processes, um, and it was about modeling uh, some deposit, some coastal deposit, so you see the link with oceanography, under a cold uh, condition, making a tow freeze cycle, and I was uh, looking how this deposit was uh, evolving, and uh, I, I, f I found that very neat, you know, I was interested, I, I, I didn't know as a like, cold environment, but I, I got interested and um, I decided to make a, to come to come in Canada and to make a PhD at Laval University. Um, yeah, so it's like you know you cross paths in your in your life and uh, but I was if you asked me like uh, twenty year, twenty years ago twenty years ago uh, no I would I, I couldn't say that oh I will study permafrost. <laughs> The first thing you do is to listen and ask questions. Then after, you, after that you can talk, mm. I think. Um, because you will know about their concerns, 
you know, about their problem. And then when you know them, you can, you know what to say and what, they are, what are the answers that they are looking for. And not, you know, only your own perspective and, uh, yeah, well, like we explain how it works in your landscape, you know. I try as much as I can, you know, you have also to work. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as I can, I try to communicate my, uh, my results in conference. And not only with my uh, fellow scientists, but also with uh, all the people and the, the people and the communities in the north. Um, of course, we try also to publish our results and uh, make uh, communication with the media to uh, make the people aware about what we are doing. You know, I came in Ottawa for the uh, Arctic Change Conference. Uh, I was at the UCOP, European Conference on Permafrost, like four months ago. And uh, before that, I, I went to a lot of workshops in Canada too. Um, there is different kind of workshop, like mm, about mountain permafrost, about uh, the impact of permafrost on infrastructures. Um, we went in other areas in the north to give um, to give a um, conference about the impact of permafrost on uh, on uh, First Nations and societies. Um, yeah. How to be politically correct about that? <laughs> you know, I have a Darwin fish. Do you know the Darwin fish? Okay, it means like I believe in evolution. Um, it's not at the difference that it's not origin, right? It is a, a, a theory, a scientific theory, relatively well proven for now. Um, so sometimes you have the thing that you are dealing with the uh, irrational. No. It is belief, it is faith. Uh, it does. It does not. Uh, this kind of people. It's hard to get some logic into their system. They are in their own logic, and they are also have like a, a, a circle thinking. You know, uh, like a, a snake eating his his, uh, his tail. Um, so, is. It's very hard. I think that they are a minority, but they they uh, they speak a lot and they are very active. And uh, I when I prepared a, a course in geomorphology for uh, at Tabasca University, I wanted to it to be very interactive. So I put a lot of link to uh, videos, document, and. At some point, I was looking for, you know, documentation explaining dating, dating technique, um, uh, carbon dating and things like that. And I made that, uh, you know, in Google, and I was surprised because, like, half of the videos were about uh, dating is crap, uh, it was skeptical about uh, evolution, it was skeptical about dating, and I say, wow, incredible. No, I didn't believe about that. And uh, at the very beginning of, the, of my geomorphology course, I talked about, um, I talked about uh, um, the very start of geomorphology, when there was two theories with, with that was called uniformit uniformitarism, you know, when the landscape uh, do not move or evolve very slowly, and catastrophism, when the landscape change you know, because uh, there was uh, an explosion or something like that. And yes, I, I start to enter this world. And I, I, I found out that there was more sometimes, more prominent in the web or to access large publics that, than scientists. And it was uh, five, six years ago. No, I, I think that improved. But sometimes we should speak up more, but trying to reach people with education, put our videos on the web, explaining what we are doing, make it our research, you know, two or three minutes of video explaining what we are doing, uh, our, our discover, very simple, you know, just a video of you walking uh, on, uh, on a site and showing, uh, this is a permafrost mound, it, it, it melts and this is a total lake. So I think that there are people that are skeptical, very motivated 
to do nothing, like, uh, you know. Um, and you have to, sometimes, you know, you have to uh, push excessively to uh, counteract to uh, this, uh, this, this, this guy. Can we convince them? As I said, I, I don't think so. I might, I, 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 I might be pessimistic about that, but uh, I think that's education and and also they have the, they have the easy job, right? Because we arrive and we say, you know, climate is changing. It will be some impact. It can be difficult. We'll have to cope with it, you know. As Churchill uh, was saying, you know, I promise you uh, blood and guts, you know, um, or something like that. And they arrive and they say, well, um, don't worry. Everything was going to be fine. Uh, all these scientists uh, are crazy. Uh, there is nothing occurring. Or it is natural. Everything gets back at the normal at some point. Who do you want to listen? The guy with, uh, the, with the sugar in the hand or the guy with uh, the lemon, you know? Ah... Uh. Yeah. Climate change is just like... Usually, you have a natural equilibrium that uh, allow to have the development of life and a natural cycle to occur uh, at, uh, at a way... In, in such, a, in such a, a rhythm that we can adapt to that, you know? It takes millennium to change from one temperature to another. Now we just put our, uh, our feet on the, uh, our foot on the accelerator, and the engine is running very fast. And uh, we can, and it starts to be very late to push on the brake. And I'm not sure that we can cope with all the change, the changements that will occur, because our industrial activities, right? Mainly that's, a, that, that's the source of the problem. Right? It's a burning, burning stuff. If I was to explain that, the problem is we are burning, burning too much stuff. Gas, oil, um, and that's affecting our atm atmosphere. And our atmosphere now is warming. So there is not, except if you come with a very uh, special recipe to uh, grab all the bad stuff in the area, in, in, in the atmosphere, I guess you have to, uh, to, uh, to slow down. My mother is like kind of hard to explain what I'm doing to her. <laughs> uh, because she's living in somewhere where, they, where, where permafrost does not exist. So uh, we don't really care. She has no idea about how it may impact other people in the world. Right?